Hi, my name is Mike and welcome to my vlog about football in general and Burnley FC in particular. A vlog that this week is coming to you from a hotel room in London. When you're the 17th most popular Burnley FC vlog on YouTube, this is the kind of international jet-setting luxury that it gets you. Yep, this channel has been quiet for a bit. A combination of the winter break, work and not even being in the country for the Fulham game. Lucky me. Means not much in the way of content or not much in the way of time to produce content, for which I apologise. Again, I apologise for the visuals and the sound. This is not how I normally do it. But I wanted to uh, actually do a few things around the Liverpool game, around some other stuff. If you are looking for some red-hot soccer chat uh, that, uh, about the previous game against Man City, I was on the No Dead Ever podcast a couple of weeks ago talking about the City game before and after. So if you want to, I had great fun. If you if you want to hear my thoughts on that, uh, click the links in the description below. Give those guys a like. Uh, that was great fun. Um, I had a laugh and uh, slipped in a few jokes as well. Saturday was another defeat, this time away at the leaders Liverpool. I was kind of hoping that our little run of pissing on Jurgen Klopp's chips would continue. After all, we beat him in the Premier League in one of our earlier seasons. Uh, we were the club to ruin their perfect record at home during their title season. We were the first club to beat them at Anfield in something like 68 games. And with Klopp leaving and the vomit-inducing farewell tour that is ensuing, maybe we could upset the odds one last time. But it was not to be in front of a record crowd or of mainly the weirdest fan base in the country. Is any other fan base so overly protective of their players and so overly familiar? They must be the only fans in the country to constantly refer to their players by their first names. And you must never touch Mo, you must never touch Bobby or Virgil or Darwin or Trent. You really mustn't ever touch Trent. But this game was our season in a nutshell, really, uh, playing well against a very good team, slightly on top by the sounds of it on the commentary, and then giving away a really dumb goal. Just as the trafford Burish debate went quiet, James Trafford goes and does that. It's not helping. It's not helping, especially following the Luton game where he screwed up. It's not helping at all when Muric is not all that good on crosses either, but he's failing to clear that fairly average bar. I'm still a supporter of James Trafford. But as we get into the dying days of the season, part of me is wondering why not just throw Muric in there and see what happens. Anyway, before half-time, Brownhill for once doesn't strap golf clubs to his feet before taking a dead ball, and O'Shea powers an excellent head at home. Second half, Trent is removed. Now, they were saying it was a knee injury, potentially, or illness, which would be going through the camp, and not, absolutely, definitely not, because yet again he's being roasted by a Burnley winger. It's amazing the excuses they have for Trent Alexander-Arnold, excuses that would not come if they weren't for the shirt that he wears. Earlier in the season, we had Klopp moving him into a midfield creative role as a tactical masterstroke. No, it's because he can't freaking defend. Yeah, he's great going forward, one of the best in the country, apart from Kieran Trippier. But when it comes to being an actual right-back, he's championship level at best. Anyway, two headed goals in the second half, making three in the game from crosses from our left. That, I think, makes it six out of the last eight conceded from that area, although I'd be a little harsh, including that City free kick. But I would love to see the full season stats on that one. It's clear that sticking older bear and previous to that Coliosio on the left is fine going forward, but the lack of help at the back is killing us. Now, I know older bear and Coliosio are young and they are learning to defend it and all that, but it does feel systemic rather than fault of the players in that position, raw as they are. And that's the thing, I'm not sure what you can do to change it. But then after Saturday, we will have played the top three, so I still have a little bit of hope, the fool that I am. If the father had taken either of his chances, maybe we'd be having a different conversation. But that's the story of the season, really. Playing well, concede a stupid goal, battle back, not take our chances. Largely because of inexperience. We might be getting relegated, and I'll do something on the reasons why later in the season, but I will go to my grave 
saying that these are not bad players. This is not a bad team or a bad manager. It's just a team and a manager. Come to think of it, a front and back office staff that isn't experienced enough at the highest level of club level, at the highest club level of football in the world. And that experience can only be gained the hard way. And they're doing it right now. But anyway, that's that. And what I really wanted to talk about this week was the rule changes proposed by uh, the governing bodies of the game. Now, sports introduce new rules all the time in response to either tactical innovations or, heaven forbid, to make it more entertaining for the paying public. And in my experience, when these changes are proposed, the fans, media, coaches, players, they all accept them and then they try to work with them. But if you compare the reactions of ice hockey or rugby to rule changes to the reactions of people in football, then there's been a huge, huge difference. There were two reactions to the suggestions last week. This couldn't possibly work. Stop messing with the game. Or, well, you could get around it by taking the second one. It's interesting how the immediate response to a potential new rule is to figure out a way to cheat it as opposed to turn it to your advantage. So what exactly was wrong with the suggestion of changes? We know that the current rules do not work, and VAR is constantly highlighting that. We already know that all yellow cards are not equal. A ref will issue a yellow for time-wasting, but is highly unlikely to do it for a second. And for a sport that has rules which remove players from the field of play, football has this weird aversion to, well, removing players from the field of play. No other sport, again, Ice hockey or both versions of rugby has a problem with teams playing with fewer players than they started with, either temporarily or permanently. So why is it impossible for a football match to finish 10 versus 10 or 10 versus 9? In fact, why shouldn't more football matches finish that way? And don't give me the ruin in the spectacle rubbish. The spectacle of football is nothing compared to other sports which are faster, more hard-hitting, and more high-scoring. But that's not the point either. Either you're watching a sport with rules or you're watching a show. Pick one. So to come up with a solution, the IFAB suggested the blue card. And the idea is that the ref can issue the blue card for an offence, including, say, tactical fouling. The player would sit on the sidelines for 10 minutes while their team play a man short. And to quote the Joker, everyone lost their goddamn mind. But where's the problem? Klopp said Saturday's game would have been the Wild West had blue cards been in use. I'm not picking it on him specifically. Most Premier League managers were, shall we say, a little non-committal on the new rules. And to be fair, it is an unreasonable thing to ask of them when the exact parameters have yet to be set. But the idea that this was disastrous and clueless immediately took hold, and not for any reasons that stood scrutiny. If the rules of the game change, then the players and the managers react accordingly. I'm old enough to remember the back pass rule coming in, and teams, after a couple of chaotic months, learned to cope, as they did with offside rule changes. Remember, once upon a time, any player could be called offside, even if they were 30 yards away on the opposite wing to the ball. There was also the changes in rules to reduce tackling from behind, plenty of other cases. But everyone seemed to just ignore this and start applying the rules to existing games when the whole point of the new rules is to change how the existing game is played. That's the thing, really. That's central hypocrisy. Managers coach the players to do this stuff. And when the authorities clamp down on it, are the first to go, well, that's a bad idea. As a player, Gary Neville was told by his manager to pressure the referee as much as possible. And he's against it now because it worked in his favour and the club's favour. And these players know that the big clubs can get the decisions, so they shout the loudest at the possibility of levelling the playing field. You bring in a blue card for dissent, and the playing time for Rodri or Bruno Fernandes is going to halve, and Arsenal are going to be playing parts of most matches with eight men. Speaking of Arsenal, we've got them this weekend, who's a team whose manager has pushed the boundaries of the rules since he got the gig. Earlier this season, Mikel Arteta was complaining about Tommy Asu getting a second yellow for time wasting in a throw-in. No one turned round to Arteta and said it was a planned play to test the rules. It clearly was. It was pre-planned. It was coached. It was a deliberate attempt to bend the rules, which didn't work. And they haven't tried it since, have they? That's the key thing. He tried to break the rules. The rules didn't break in his favour. The players and the managers adapted and adapted pretty quickly. 
but then you still heard the call. These new rules will be mean the players are sitting on the sidelines. Then don't break the rules then. I find it so incredibly odd that managers spend weeks drilling their teams into certain movement patterns and then on a match day stand on the sidelines yelling at their players to move five yards sideways, forwards or backwards. But when it comes to tactical fouls and yelling in the referee's face, nothing to do with me, Gov. Like I say, you don't want your players to go off for 10 minutes for a tactical foul? Don't tell them to do tactical fouls. It's similar to the extra time added on, which was making such a noise at the start of the season. I don't have the stats to hand, but it feels like at the start of the season, the extra time added on for each half was up to about 10 minutes. But now the number is slowly coming down, and it's not just because the referees are getting more lenient. It's because the players and the managers adapted, and they realised they couldn't get away with it. Tactical fouling is a problem in the game. We all know it. Every team does it. And if sending a player off permanently is a problem, why should a 10-minute penalty not be the solution? Goalkeepers wasting time. Give a corner. That sounds a really good solution to me. Although, given the way we defend corners this year, maybe not. But the point is this. The authorities are trying to do something to improve the game. And the managers and the media are pushing back against it. You would think that they were more interested in the product than they were in actually, you know, cheating and ensuring there's a bias to their club. But then, I don't follow a big club, so I'm always going to feel that way. And that just makes me bitter, apparently. But that just kind of shows how the media and the big clubs just push the authorities around. In that they introduce ways of cheating and they complain when people call them on it. And that's the hypocrisy at the end of the day. The hypocrisy of the big clubs, their managers and some of their players. They're a bunch of hypocrites. They're a bunch of arseholes who have media cheerleaders to cover their back and fire their bullets for them. And I really wish that the referees and the authorities grow a spine and, yes, introduce these changes as quickly as possible. I am all for blue cards. I am all for the referees turning round and actually giving them to the big clubs and teaching them for once that this isn't in their favour. If you've got any comments about this video, please feel free to leave them down below and I will respond where I can. If you liked it, click the like button. And if you like what I do, have a look around the rest of the channel and click subscribe to be notified when I produce new content.